Good morning. You quiet down so quickly. <laughs> it's good to hear the, the vibe in the room, though. It's good to have you here. If you are a guest, a special welcome. We're really glad you're here this morning. And please come again. And uh, we always want to welcome anybody who would have a heart to hear the Word of God. A couple of things. And one, I'm just going to say it up front. Um, I'm not going to greet you today. I'm, I'm not at quite 100%, and I don't want you to be there. So uh, consider yourselves all greeted uh, rather than passing anything on. But anyway, a um, couple of real quick things. Council meets tomorrow night. So keep that in mind, and congregation be uh, always praying for direction and wisdom for the council. So just encourage that. Uh, next Sunday, well, first of all, before next Sunday, let's talk about today. We have a special guest, one of our Gideon representatives, Dale Knutson, from the Centerville Free Lutheran Church, and he's going to give us a Gideon update in just a moment. So welcome, Dale. And uh, there will be a love offering received at the back of the church on your way out for the Gideon ministry. So if you would like to give toward that, please be prepared to do that as you leave today. And uh, Dale, when you, you, can be my, you can be me today and greet people in the back. <laughs> or I'll get a pail for you or something. And uh, you've got something to receive it? Okay, he's got a basket. So thank you for being here. Then next week, we have uh, Nate and Rhoda Jory and they are our missionaries in Uganda, or one of our families in Uganda. And they have a powerful ministry. And they are on the, line, the front lines of spiritual warfare in that place like we can't imagine. And I don't know what they're going to share of that. Um, he's going to be delivering the message. And I'm waiting word. I haven't heard word because I don't know how many of their family. They've got a, a whole bunch of kids. And I don't know how many, I don't know that they're all going to be here, but I don't know if we need to provide lodging, and I'm, I'm waiting to hear from them. And if you are able or willing to host any of the, of the Jory family, please let me know. Um, I'm going to be going in this week for a procedure, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to be much help to them um, next weekend. But if you are able to do that, please... Uh, Consider that and then let me know. And I don't even know if they need it for sure. They may have it all lined up already, but I just haven't heard word back. So, Also, I was just going to make one more plug for the adult Sunday school uh, on spiritual warfare class. And I took our confirmation kids and sat in on that class today just to save on my voice so I didn't lose it in this hour. And our kids even, I, our, our students really enjoyed it even in the... Uh, and I enjoyed it. So I, I, one more plug, just if you're thinking that you should have more information and grow a little bit in that area, I encourage you to attend. Thank you for that. Check your bulletin. Uh, Lenten service on Wednesday night. Um, I probably won't be able to be here that night. Jeremy, are you here? <laughs> or someone? Do you know? Uh, we'll be watching an episode of The Chosen and any discussion or whatever but uh, I think this one also might be a roughly an hour long so and if you're not able to be here Jeremy let me know and I'll line somebody up so thank you any other announcements that need to be made if not I'm going to open our service just by this reminder of something Jesus said it was the night before he was crucified. He's in the upper room with his disciples. It's in the 17th chapter of John. And he was talking to the Father. He was praying in the midst of his disciples. And he said, Father, this is eternal life, that they know you. That they know you. And Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the, the, the Anointed One, whom you have sent. That, just that statement is so critical because it distinguishes head knowledge and heart knowledge. To know about God is something, here I am preaching, and I'm not even at that point in the service, and to know God is something else. So let's pray. Would you bow with me? Father, let this truth resound in our hearts today with a yearning 
to know you. And Lord, I know that most of these people here right now know you, but a yearning to know you more and to know your heart, to know your will, to know how you would use us. God, we pray that even today you would strengthen that yearning and our knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to call on uh, Dale Knutson at this point. And Dale, if you'd share with us a little bit about what's going on with the Gideons and uh, how they're influencing the world. Thank you for being here. The Gideons International is an association of Christian business and professional men who seek to bring people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ by giving them the opportunity to read God's written word. We place that word in hotels and motels, in schools and colleges, in hospitals and certain other medical facilities, in prisons and other crossroads of life. There are about 150,000 Gideons and 90,000 auxiliary members doing that in some 200 countries, territories, and possessions. It is our goal this year to uh, place or distribute about 57 million Bibles and uh, New Testaments. Now, the Gideon ministry is built upon its relationship with the local church. The local church is its foundation. So I'm here this morning to thank you for being a part of that foundation. Trust me, we really appreciate that. So I would ask if you would continue to be a part of that foundation. And first of all, pray for the Gideon ministry. Prayer is vital if we are going to accomplish our purpose. Each Saturday morning at our prayer breakfast, we pray for Redeemer Free Lutheran Church and Pastor Gilvin. And we would appreciate it if you would pray for us as well. And I would particularly encourage you to pray for the scriptures that you provide, and especially for the people who will receive them, that they will read them and ultimately receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Next, I would ask if you would continue to use our Gideon card program and pay for Bibles placed by Gideons as memorials to loved ones. Uh, there is a display back on that uh, desk in the uh, entryway out here that contains those memorial cards. You use them just as you would a uh, sympathy card. You uh, fill it out and give it to the family. And then there is a small, uh, smaller colored envelope inside that you use to mail your donation to our local Gideon representative. There are also uh, special occasion cards that you can use to recognize someone on a special occasion, such as a birthday or anniversary. And then there are thinking of you cards that you can use as a get well card or to let someone know that they are in your thoughts and prayers. Then I would ask if you would provide a free will offering for scriptures this morning. As uh, Pastor Gilman mentioned, I'll be in the back of the church to receive that offering. Or um, if you have already uh, made a donation uh, in previous Sundays this month, uh, I thank you very much for doing that. Uh, or you can also just use the regular procedure that you would do to give a, an offering this morning for, for the Gideons. Or you can use uh, the envelope attached to your bullets and insert to mail a gift. For about a dollar and 55 cents, you can provide for the purchase and placement of a scripture somewhere around the world. That includes all the costs involved in getting a scripture printed and into the hands of someone who needs it. And it may be someone like Emmy. Emmy was raised in a family that worshiped the dead. 
his entire spiritual life, his thoughts and his prayers, was controlled by ancestor worship. In his family, no one believed in God. They believed that the spirits of their ancestors could help and protect them. So Emmy thought that everybody had their own God. In school one day, he was given a New Testament by a Gideon, and he began to read it. He learned that there was a true and living God, only one God, and he learned about Jesus. In 1 Peter 2.24, he read, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So Emmy decided to repent of his sins before the Lord and accept Jesus as his Savior. And it became his joy to serve the living God and to place his life in Jesus' hands. Thank you, Pastor Gilman, and thank you, your uh, congregation, for your time here this morning. But most of all, thank you for providing God's word for people who need it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. You know, that, that brief uh, anecdote of this person whose life was, who was taught that the spirits of the dead are what guide our lives, that's a very common thing I know in one place where the Jories are. And uh, maybe, I don't know what they'll be talking about, but perhaps they'll be bringing that up next week as well. But, but thank you for sharing that. Also, I, I neglected to mention in the announcements that uh, not only is there this love offering today for the Gideons, but next Sunday there will be a love offering for the Jories. So if you'd like to, to bless that ministry, uh, be thinking of how you would do that as well. We're going to continue then as we enter into just some moments of worship as we sing, Be Exalted, O God. And let's let this worship be not lips, but hearts. Let's praise Him.
Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, you, you truly alone are worthy to be worshipped. And God, we know that we have no right in ourselves to even approach you. And we know that sin would prohibit that. And yet you have taken that, that hindrance away. And Lord, this morning we again acknowledge that and thank you and praise you for that reality. And please hear our confession, Jesus, as we come together corporately to acknowledge our sin. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for our sins. We know that we cannot have eternal life without his sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for the blood covenant. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming our sacrificial lamb so that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and help us in all of our words, thoughts, and deeds to honor you and the sacrifice you gave for us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Romans 5, 9 says, Since we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. This morning as we come before God's throne of grace and power, uh, I have this on my list and we'll add to it in a moment here. I'm going to pray for the Gideons as we've been requested. Uh, also, on Wednesday, Deneen Gannon goes in for her surgery. I don't know if you're here, Deneen, this morning, but let's keep Deneen in our prayers. She's been through a long battle, and the chemo part's done, but the surgery part is now. So Deneen will be in our prayers. Alberta Campen isn't able to be with Anton this morning. She's home with a lot of sciatic pain, and we're going to pray for relief and healing. Uh, you received a prayer chain this week for Eileen Huseman. She did go in for surgery and is feeling much better and thankful for your prayers, and she wanted to pass that on to you. Uh, Linda Fossum is uh, having tests done for an issue with ability to swallow and choking, and they, they've ruled out cancer, they think, which is great news, but they don't know what's causing it, so we're going to pray for uh, discernment and answers. And then we're going to continue to pray for Dwight Scott, this pain that he's been having, which is who knows what's causing it. Uh, not only is it not going away, it's beginning to go to the other hand and he's not able to get in at this point, they say, until the 10th of April. Uh, he, and I know Dwight's not sleeping well because of it uh, or at all. So we need to pray for answers and relief and healing. Other prayer requests? Yes, Laura. Were you able to hear uh, her brother-in-law, Gary, that we've been praying for, uh, had the results of his test back, and he's been in a long battle with cancer. The chemo they discovered, it's, it's been a year now this week, the chemo did not work. The cancer has doubled. They're waiting to hopefully get approval for an immunotherapy process, uh, but cancer is spread throughout, so let's keep, we just need to pray that God would speak to his heart and yeah so thank you any other requests <laughs> whose birthday was that Brian, Brian Jarman's birthday <laughs> that's what you get Brian when you, that's good is it today Brian okay happy birthday Any others? Garen yep. has a birthday on Tuesday. Garen has a birthday on Tuesday. Uh, Mendering. Uh, 
And John has a birthday when? Tuesday. This is a big week here. Okay. Bill. Callie Blackstone today. Daughter of Karen and Bill. Okay. Kurt. Thank you for that. I, I would, yes, thank you. I, I will appreciate your prayers. I, I said I probably wouldn't be able to be here. Thir- I'm having the shoulder replaced on Thursday morning. So uh, just pray that that goes well. Pray that this cold is gone so they can do it, so I can get it done, I guess, for one thing. But any others? <laughs> Maybe you can sit in for me, Todd. I <laughs> You got a bad shoulder too? Yeah. Julie. Say again, who is having the medically stressful? Ben Westra's parents. Joel and Vicki Westra. And Lane will be having a procedure tomorrow, and we're praying for success for that. Thank you. Pam. Thank you, Pam. I should write that down first because I know we're going to pray for that every week. So, thank you. All right, let's join our hearts. Lord, we sometimes don't know how to pray because there is so much going on in the world. Some of you, much of it not of you. And we need wisdom and discernment. And we need understanding, Lord, that you use all things for good with those who love you. Even the things that we ask you to take away, sometimes you use for good with those who love you. So God, as we pray, we just pray that we would be in your will. And we pray, God, that you would see and honor faith as we turn to you. And Lord, where faith is lacking, we ask you to strengthen it in us. Lord, thank you for the work of the Gideons and for Dale's testimony this morning. Thank you, God, that in spite of a growing opposition to this word, it continues to go forth. And when, you, when it goes forth, you have promised that it will not return void without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. And God, we know your purpose is to bring salvation to people's souls. So God, we ask your anointing upon every word that is placed. We pray, God, for a special anointing uh, right here this morning for those Bibles and Testaments that will be placed by this congregation. And we pray, God, that uh, those who open your word because they came across it would have a heart that is of good soil. And you know who those people are. We do not. So we give them into your hands and into your purpose. Father, we pray for Deneen Gannon this week as she goes in on Wednesday for uh, a pretty major surgery. And pray, God, that it would be accomplished, that it would accomplish its purpose and that the cancer, uh, she would receive a report that the cancer is removed from her body. Give her victory, Jesus, in this battle. Lord, we pray for Alberta Campen and ask for relief and whatever is causing this pain down her leg, that you would touch that place and bring healing and comfort physically. Uh, thank you for her faith and her trust in you. We pray for Eileen Huseman and praise you for uh, relief from the pain she was in and just for a grateful heart that she has 
I uh, thank you for hearing every prayer. Lord, we lift up Linda Fossum and ask for answers uh, to a, a situation that is causing trouble and discomfort and perhaps even risk of when, when swallowing isn't able to be accomplished as it should. We ask, God, that these tests would reveal the cause and that you would give direction in resolving it. Father, we pray for Dwight in this pain that is going into his hands uh, from an unknown for an unknown reason or from an unknown source. God, give him comfort. In Jesus' name, you can touch him and bring healing. And Lord, if you choose to use a medical procedure, we ask God that you would allow that to happen sooner than what they know and what is planned. So Lord, we just commend him into your keeping today again. Father, we pray for Laura's brother-in-law, Gary, and he received, they received a, a report they didn't want to hear, but probably suspected. And God, this is a heavy, a heavy thing against him. And it's attempting to take his physical life. God, we pray that in the midst of this terrible battle and difficult battle, your voice would be heard and received and that it would bring comfort and God if you would we know you are able to bring healing whatever your purpose God we ask that it be received and give glory to you both in his life and in all who know how you are working and how you love him Father we pray for Lane Jervik as he goes in for this procedure tomorrow that it would be uh, successful and relieve whatever, uh, whatever is not right in his body. So we entrust him into your keeping. And Father, we pray for Ben Westra's parents, Joel and Vicki, as they're having a very difficult, uh, stressful week with medical situations weighing heavily upon them this week. And Lord, you know all the details of this. And we ask God that you would uh, speak into that a word of truth and power and authority over every circumstance and that they would receive it and be comforted and strengthened by it. Then, Father, we praise you for the, again, the celebrations of life and we ask a special blessing on those celebrating birthdays this week. We want to lift up to you Brian Jarman today and Callie Blackstone today and Garen Maindering on Tuesday, John Ostrad on Tuesday. Lord, in each of these homes and families and lives, uh, bring special blessing and special awareness of uh, how you are working in their lives and vision for where you are taking them from this point forward. And we know it's a good place, God, because you are involved. And then, Lord, we lift up our nation, a nation which needs to turn its eyes to you. And God, we pray that you would increase the number of people who do know you in their prayers for this nation. We ask, God, that you would put it on the hearts of more and more people to engage in the spiritual warfare that is going on in the world. We pray, God, for power to be released, for, for discernment in knowing how to pray, for courage, boldness, and strength to walk the walk you call us to walk. We ask, God, that as your word would be spoken, it would accomplish its purpose. And we pray, God, that those who are in positions of authority and decision-making would be influenced by truth, and righteousness rather than unrighteousness. God, we know that you have called us into this time in history for a purpose and have accomplished much of your purpose through this nation. But God, we ask today that we would continue to be in the hands of the living God and continue to serve his purpose. And we ask, God, that you would hinder every force that would come against that. In Jesus' name. Lord, now to you all glory, wisdom, power, authority 
and praise is given. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we trespass us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. If you would turn to your bulletin once again and join responsively in our reading from Ephesians 2. And church, just so you know, this isn't word for word from, sometimes from Scripture, I'm taking concepts and applying them to us. So if you look up Ephesians 2, it won't be word for word, but it'll be, uh, the message is what the word says here. Remember that at one time, the Gentiles in the flesh were separated from Christ, strangers to the covenants of promise. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He has made us one, having broken down the dividing wall of hostility, abolishing the demands of the law. We have been made fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Amen. And to call on our ushers at this time to receive our tithes and offerings. bring us the readings for today. Good morning. I'll be reading from the New Living Testament this morning. Our Old Testament is from uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11. That can be found on page 103 of your pew Bible. For the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. And the New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. That can be found on page 1025 of your pew Bible. Under the old system, the blood of the goats and the bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. 
That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and the people, and that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. And our gospel reading is from Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29, and that can be found on page 846. Please rise if you're able. As, reading, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So in today's readings. You may be seated. We'll sing uh, Nothing But the Blood. We're waiting for this to connect here. There's a, a passage in the book of, in the letter to the Romans, in the first chapter, that makes it pretty clear what God tells us about knowing Him. It says this, What can be known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
in the things that have been made. And then he says this, so we are without excuse. The world will be held accountable to God without excuse because it is known that he exists because of what has been made. In other words, there is a God consciousness in every single human being that ever comes into existence. And it's really, when that is the reason that there are all the religions of the world. Because of this God consciousness that God put in us, uh, we have a yearning for God. It's the way we were made. And in this human-wide search, many people, many, have been deceived into believing things about God which simply aren't true. And those things that people believe about who God is are so varied, and they're so conflicting, and sometimes so twisted, but they're all stemming out of this God consciousness that God built into people. You know, people don't just stumble into false beliefs by chance and, and become convicted of falsehood by chance. I mean, it's our nature, so we're prone to that. But people are led into deception. There are forces at work spiritual forces. It's why I'm, I'm encouraging you so much to get into this spiritual warfare class, because it's a real thing. And everybody's involved in it. 1 Timothy 4.1 says of these battles that every human being is in, he says they, that these, these, these teachings and doctrines and religions that are twisted and corrupt and varied and conflicting, do you know what Paul says the source of that is? He says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says these are teachings of not people who just don't know God. They're teachings of demons. Teachings of demons. I mean, that's a scary thought when you think that the people of this world, the majority of the people of this world are, are susceptible to the teachings of demons. Do you remember the, this was, a, I think it goes back 20 years ago now, that devastating tsunami that hit Indonesia? It was 2004 in December. Do you remember that, some of you? It, it took 230,000 lives. It was, it was uh, from the result of an earthquake off the coast, and it swept over that nation of Indone Indonesia, or that whole area, in a terribly devastating fashion. There was a story that came out after the, the tsunami had swept through and there was found in the debris left by that tsunami a baby that was still living in the debris. Nine women came forward and said, that's my child. Nine different women. I mean, it kind of reminds you of what Solomon had to deal with back in his day with the, with the child that was the two children, one died, and two mothers claimed that the living one was theirs. But anyway, eventually, in this case, through DNA, which they didn't have in Solomon's day, uh, the true mother was found. God brought truth to that situation in another way. But, but through DNA, DNA testing, the true mother was identified. The, and her statement was, after she was relieved to receive her child back, that the first thing she was going to do was to fulfill her vows to smash a hundred coconuts at the temple of the elephant god Ganesh and then offer sweet rice to the warrior god Murugan and then kill a rooster for the god Kali. See, she had a god consciousness in her and she was doing everything she knew to make sure she was in good standing with whoever god was and she was trying to appease them. But in 1 Corinthians 10.20, Paul says again what he said to Timothy. He said, What pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons, not to God. So even though God designed humanity 
to know about him. In fact, what can be known about God is plain to us, he said. So he designed us to know about God, but people don't know who the true God is through that God consciousness. That's not an inherent thing. The searching for him is. Knowing him personally is not. They don't know his character just naturally. They don't know God's heart. They don't even know his name. His name isn't Kali. The Lord is not like the ideas that people have in their minds of who God is. And yet God wants us to know Him. Did you know that? He wants everyone to know Him. Because when we do, He knows that there is a peace that comes over you and we no longer are living in the fear of angering Him by not doing something right. But we have this assurance of an unconditional love in us. It changes things when you know that. And what I'd like to begin to talk about this morning is how God has made it possible for us to know His heart and thereby His intentions for our lives and for the world. That possibility, though, comes to us only by us accepting an invitation from Him. What's the invitation? to enter into a covenant relationship with the one true and living God. A covenant relationship. Well, how do we know God wants us to know Him this closely? And I'm going to let God answer that question if you want to, if that question would be in your mind. It says in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not a rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So God invites you to understand him, and to know Him in a way that isn't possible, he says, unless we enter into this covenant relationship with Him. And the covenant that God has required for this to happen, are you aware that it is a blood covenant? But why a blood covenant? That sounds kind of gross. Because it is the closest and it is the most enduring and the most solemn and the most sacred of all covenants in the Bible. A blood covenant. And it was a covenant that was entered into by many different people. Uh, particularly, we read about it in the Old Testament. But we might not be really fully aware of what this covenant entailed because the details aren't often spelled out to you in the way that I'm going to spell them out to you in the next couple of minutes here. But people in Israel knew what it meant to enter into a blood covenant. And it didn't have to be spelled out every time. But one thing I'm going to ask you to keep in mind as we go through the steps of this kind of covenant is that the Old Testament blood covenant is always, in every case, pointing ahead to the new blood covenant that the New Testament says is fulfilled in Jesus. So all of the Old Testament examples of this are pointing to the cross. And as we look at what a blood covenant involved, I, I think you're going to probably see some glimpses of what's at the center of the New Testament gospel. So this morning I'm going to go through uh, these steps, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this rather quickly. And then there's going to be a part two to this message, and it'll be two weeks from now because next week the juries will be here. And I'll just tell you, today it's going to be a little bit probably factual and detailed, um, descriptive, 
And then in part two, you're going to get the application where it becomes personal. And we'll see how it actually played out in real life through one of the, the persons it told about in the scriptures, and then how it applies to you and me today. So you need to be here for both parts. How's that for a shameless ploy to say, come to church? Uh, otherwise, either part won't be as meaningful to you if you don't have them to fit together. So we're going to see you all in two weeks, uh, and hopefully before then. But let, let's begin with this. If you were entering into a blood covenant with another person, the first thing you would do would be take off your robe or your coat and give it to the person with whom you were entering the covenant. To a Hebrew person, that person's robe re represented that person's identity. By taking it off, and giving it to someone else, you would symbolically be saying, I'm giving myself to you, my total being, my life, everything I am, I'm giving it to you, I pledge to you, my life. Second step, you would take off your belt, and you would give it to that person. You know, some of you are familiar with the spiritual uh, armor that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, and one of those pieces is the belt. And as you remember, the belt is what held your weapon. I mean, in a physical sense, and I think Paul, when he was writing that, was probably, well, he was in prison, he was probably looking at a Roman guard, and he had all of this attire on, and he was using this Roman guard's apparel and putting it into spiritual application. But the belt held their weapon, it held their bow, it held their sword. Uh, so when you gave your belt to another person, you're telling them, I'm giving you all my strength, and you're, you're pledging your strength and your support and your protection. So in other words, you're saying to him or her, if anybody attacks you, they're attacking me because your battles are my battles. I mean, nations make these kind of covenants without the blood part. NATO is that kind of covenant, isn't it? If they attack one nation, you're attacking all of us. I mean, it's kind of the same idea. Third step. You actually cut the covenant by taking an animal to be sacrificed, splitting it down the, the middle lengthwise from nose to tail, all, right down the backbone, and then laying out the two halves of the split animal. And it's the only time in the Bible, the only covenant that an animal is split down the middle like this in this blood covenant ceremony. So the two halves are laid down side by side and you and your covenant partner would, would stand back to back between the two halves of the animal. And then you would each go different directions and do a figure eight around the two halves of the animal until you come to the middle again, and this time you're facing each other as you're, as you're walking through this animal in a figure eight. And in doing this, you're saying two things. You're saying you're dying to yourself, giving up your right to your life as the sole uh, authority over it and you're beginning a new walk with your covenant partner until death and since the blood covenant is a solemn pact you would point down to the the animal that is dead lying in blood at your feet and you would say these words may God so do to me and more if ever I break this covenant You know, I think of the Old Testament book of Ruth, and it, it's not, it doesn't give us all the details, but between Ruth and Naomi, there was a covenant that was made. And do you remember the words that were spoken? And I, I suspect there were, there were a lot of the steps involved, if not all of them, that aren't mentioned, but part of the covenant that, we, that is revealed are these words from Ruth, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. A covenant. Fourth step. You'd raise your arms, you'd both cut the palms of your hand, and you'd put them together, and your blood would flow into each other. And as your blood intermingles, you would swear your allegiance to the other person. You know, maybe... 
your, our closest participation in this was when we were kids and you pricked your finger. Remember, did you ever do that? And you swore to be bound to that person for the rest of your life until your mom found out and broke the covenant? <laughs> but Leviticus 17.11, as we heard, it says the life of flesh is in the blood. Life is in the blood. So the intermingling of the blood means that you're putting aside your own nature and putting on the nature of your covenant partner. Symbolically, it means you've become one. The fifth step. As your blood is intermingling, you exchange names. Each one taking a part of the other person's name and making it part of your own. Step number six. You're mixing your blood together again. This time, you're making a, a, a cut across your forearm and you're raising your forearms and again, allowing your blood to intermingle. And it leaves a scar on your forearm as a permanent reminder of the covenant responsibilities that you are making to each other. Uh, if someone tries to harm you, what you do is raise your arm and show them your scar, and in effect you're saying, there's more to me than meets the eye. If you're coming against me, you're also coming against my blood covenant partner. And by the way, this isn't unique to ancient Hebrew culture, these types of covenants. Uh, many cultures through the centuries have practiced blood covenants, and it's because God created us to be in relationship with Him and with other people that there is this yearning for relationship in us. It's that inborn desire for it that is part of our God consciousness. You know, it is, I don't know if you uh, have studied him or in a class heard about or read about him, the explorer Henry Stanley. Um, it's been said that he cut, as he, as he walked through Africa exploring, it's been said that he cut covenant with 50 different African tribal leaders in his journey. So anytime he would come across an unfriendly tribe, he would lift up his arm and they would see 50 scars on his forearm. And they would know that if they're coming against this man, they're coming against 50 tribes that he's aligned with. That's pretty powerful. Today, in our culture, when we meet friends, we shake hands. We don't think about it. But it's kind of got distant trappings of what this blood covenant is about. Minus the blood, I guess. Seventh step. You would stand before witnesses and recite the terms of your covenant. Everything I have, everything I own, is also yours. If I die, your chil my children become your children by adoption. The same time you're taking, you take on all my liabilities. If I get in trouble financially, I don't have to, come, I have to come and ask you for money. I just say, where's our checkbook? So anyway, standing before witnesses, both parties read off a list of their assets and a list of their liabilities. And then step eight, you share a memorial meal to complete the covenant union. And in place of the animal's blood and body, you'd have bread and wine. Isn't it interesting in Genesis 49, 11 that wine is even called the blood of grapes? So you'd break the bread and give it to each other and serve each other the wine signifying a oneness, a new nature. Then the last step, you would leave a memorial to the covenant that you had just established. Usually in that day it was a tree that was planted and it was as a young tree dipped in the blood of the sacrificed animal and planted in the ground uh, as a lasting testimony to your covenant relationship. And this would complete the ceremony. So from now on, you would be known as friends. And that term in that day, when they made this kind of covenant, the term friend carried a lot more weight to it than we think of when we use the term friend today. It was a lot more to it. And I think it might give us a little insight into what was going on in the upper room the night before Jesus died when he offered the bread dipped 
and handed to Judas. He was offering him a kind of friendship that was centered in a blood covenant. And the Bible says in John that the instant Judas received it from him, the devil entered into him and he immediately got up and ran out of the room. See, the, do- the devil recognized the power of that covenant. Judas maybe didn't, maybe he did, I don't know, but uh, in- immediately the spiritual warfare came against him. Very familiar, as I said, to the people, the Jewish people, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, Abraham cut a covenant with Abimelech, who was a Philistine king. Jacob cut a covenant with his uncle Laban. We've already talked about Ruth and Naomi. But in closing, what we need to remember is that everything God was doing in the Old Testament wasn't just for the people of the Old Testament. All Scripture has meaning. All Scripture has significance for every human being for eternity. So we look beyond the circumstances of those particular incidents. And in two weeks, as I said, we'll look more closely at how this applies to our personal lives today and how Jesus is at the center of that application. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you poured out your blood for us. And life is in the blood. You gave your life in exchange for ours. You brought us into relationship with you. And God, sometimes, too often, we take that for granted. Forgive us. Help us to know and then to live in the covenant that you have established. Amen. And by the way, I, I didn't put this in my message. I just thought about it. But when God cut that covenant with Abraham, it was a blood covenant. They split the animal nose to tail. And you, know, you know what God did to Abraham then? Because he knew that any human being who would be involved in a covenant is going to fail on his part because of our nature. So God, as soon as the animal was lying there, they were about to stand back to back and do the figure eight. He put Abraham to sleep. And then God says, and it's described as a flaming torch and a, oh, what's the other thing? Two things that represent God. And they did the moving around the animal. One of them for God, one of them on behalf of Abraham. Do you, under, do you see how even that points to Christ? Jesus being our part. Because he knew we would fail. He who had no sin became sin. And God doing his part. Therefore, the covenant that was established in Jesus is not going to fail because he was righteous even though we were not. And he stood in our place to make the covenant. Anyway, I thought I was done. I am done now. So, we're going to be singing our final hymn, uh, number 245, And Can It Be That I Should Gain?
words that Paul wrote to the Galatians, interestingly, are these. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me greet you from here. Thank you for coming. Have a great week. The Lord bless you all. Uh, Gideon offering in the back. Dale, you might want to head back before the congregation gets out. And thank you for being here. Thank you all. God bless you.